بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The purpose of this video is to discuss with you guys some thoughts I had after the debate that Daniel recently had with a Muslim feminist about the topic of Muslim women and education. Some of you guys have asked me to post a response, write a post, do a video, something to share my thoughts on what happened and the topic of that debate. So here we are. Now, one of the most often repeated attempts to discredit Daniel's position is to say this line. But you married a wife who went to Harvard, you hypocrite. I am that wife he married from Harvard. Let me tell you the same quick story that Daniel mentioned in his opening statement in the debate. The first meal that we had together right after we got married was a dinner that we sat down to and he had just recently graduated from Harvard and I was still a senior at Harvard. I was in my last year. And in the middle of this meal, he says at some point something like, you know, I really don't believe in women's education. And I almost dropped my spoon. He said it so casually, conversationally, as though any rational, normal, reasonable human being would agree easily. He said it like you would say, oh, the sky is blue, or something equally clear and obvious. And I thought, um, who is this guy that I just married? And does he remember that I'm still a Harvard student? So if you felt shocked hearing him say that in the debate, so did I years, years ago. And you're not alone. As Muslims living in a rapidly secularized modern world, it's natural for us to feel shocked, to feel very, very surprised and even put off by hearing statements like this, expressing sentiments that we've literally never heard before. What do you mean you don't believe in women's education? It seemed to me years ago to be, you know, as though somebody was saying, I don't believe in breathing air or I don't really believe in eating food or drinking water. I was completely baffled. So that conversation right after we got married, that conversation continued and we kind of delved deeper into the topic. And despite my initial shock, I had to give my new husband credit. He thought of things in a unique way that accounted for far-reaching consequences and long-term results and in a way that was not cowed by just mainstream popular opinion, just by whatever people were thinking or saying at the time. He was solely in pursuit of the truth, regardless of how weird it might sound or how offensive it may seem to our modern ears. So I was begrudgingly impressed, but I was still not fully sold on the idea, on the conceptual level, that the pushing of mass education on women was necessarily a bad thing. I was still writing my senior thesis in anthropology and still awaiting my Harvard graduation for God's sake. Education is just the civilized thing to do. Now, almost a decade and a half later, after that conversation, I have some clarity on the subject and I'd like to share some thoughts with you guys. I asked myself very recently, what exactly did my studying at Harvard do for me? What kind of positive things did I gain from my four years at one of America's best and most prestigious universities? To be honest, I drew a blank. My mind hovered on the verge of answers, trying really hard to come up with at least one positive thing, just a short list of really good things that I got having gone to college. But the truth is, I can't remember the titles of the classes that I took at Harvard. I was there for four years, which means eight semesters, and I took four classes each semester. So I took a lot of classes. And I remember really liking some more than others, and I really loved some of my classes. But honestly, wallahi, I cannot remember the titles of a lot of those classes. I learned Hebrew while I was at Harvard out of curiosity, but I forgot most of it now due to lack of use except for a handful of very basic phrases like Toda Raba, thank you very much, Shalom for Salem, Boker Tov, Erev Tov for good morning, good evening, that kind of thing. Aside from that, I forgot it all. I read a lot of books whose titles are now blurry in my memory, and I wrote a ton of papers, a ton of essays that I cannot find right now. My senior thesis which I spent all of my senior year writing, is now collecting dust on one of my shelves at home, untouched for over a decade. I met a lot of people during my years at Harvard, many who were very nice, Muslim, non-Muslim, but I'm not in contact with most of them now. And the few that I'm still in touch with today 
are very, very busy. I'm busy, they're busy, and we kind of text each other every now and then just to say salam. And life has taken us in very different directions and that's okay, this is how life is. The two main influences in my life have been my father before marriage and then my husband after marriage. Not my Harvard professors, not my classmates or my roommates on campus. Next, I asked myself another question to which the answer was much more immediate. I asked myself, what potential dangers did I face at Harvard? What were some of the risks that I exposed myself to in college? Now, the answer to this question was unsettlingly easy to think of. A long list of potential dangers rattling themselves off instinctively in my mind. Now, before I share with you this list of dangers, let's note how some Muslims sometimes conflate things inappropriately. There are some Muslims who confuse things like education, by which they mean modern secular academics, to uh, things like ulum al-din, ilm in Islam. And they say things like, going to college is super important for women and for men. It's important for everybody. Don't you know that the first word revealed in the Quran was iqra? Haven't you heard that hadith about seeking knowledge being obligatory upon every single Muslim? So this is why I went to college and I had a PhD in mechanical engineering. Hello? Let's see what kind of knowledge people actually get in college, shall we? The points that I'm about to share with you are 10, and they really shed light on the divine wisdom of the ayah that says, The translation of the meaning of this ayah is, and for women, remain in your homes and do not display yourselves in the tabarruj of the first jahiliyyah. The college environment is detrimental for both men and women. It hurts everybody the way it is now, but it hits women much, much harder. Women tend to be more impressionable than men, their mentality quite a bit more open and more malleable than men due to women's higher scores in trait agreeableness. So putting women in a bad environment is much more dangerous than putting men in a bad environment. And lastly, before I go into the list, none of this stuff that I'm going to share with you now is just theoretical or abstract or it happened to somebody else that is only hearsay for me. This stuff is stuff I've seen with my own eyes firsthand that I came up to close, up close and personal with in college. The first thing is loss of dean. College, especially when you live on campus and far from home, college is a breeding ground for kuf. There's no other way to put it. I don't want to sugarcoat it. This is the reality. It's only by the rahmah of Allah and the fadl of Allah on me, Allah's bounty on me, undeservedly, that I made it out still a Muslim, still trying to practice, still clinging to Islam by the aid of Allah. ta'ala. I know many, many girls who didn't make it. Many took off their hijabs. Some stopped praying. Some started fooling around with guys, getting a boyfriend secretly, not telling their parents. A lot strayed away from Islam. And this doesn't only affect Muslims. In fact, this sort of attitude of, or this shift towards lack of religion, lack of religiosity, lack of belief in God affects everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. I remember one of my roommates um, in college, let's call her Kelly, was a devout Christian. She was a Protestant when we first started out all together as freshmen at Harvard. By our senior year, so four years later, she was a proud atheist. And one day I asked her about this because we were pretty close. So I could ask her these questions, honestly. So I said, you know, Ke uh, Kelly, why are you uh, no longer a Christian? Why did you leave belief in God? And why are you an atheist now? And she literally said, I took Steven Pinker's class and it just made sense. Atheism or not believing in God just makes a lot more sense than believing in God. So I'm done. And just like that, atheism pushed out theism. Steven Pinker, if you don't know, is a big name, popular atheist, kind of like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. This loss of deen is very common in college for Muslims and non-Muslims alike, like my poor roommate Kelly. May Allah guide her. Number two, zina and sexual immorality. College is notoriously a time to experiment sexually for non-Muslims, and very sadly, some Muslims follow suit. Partying, hooking up, these, these things are the norm on many, many college campuses. Basically, you're taking a very large group of young men and young women at the peak of their youth, their energy, their attractiveness, their hormones, and also at the peak of their immaturity and their lack of life experience and wisdom. 
and then you're throwing them all together. And then on top of that, you're stripping them of the supervision of their parents and their elders. What do you think will happen? What do you expect? Number three, LGBTQ. An extension of sexual freedom is homosexuality and being gender fluid and being non-binary, right? These are all terms that are easily thrown around these days and we've all heard them. But college campuses are especially a place where all of this stuff kind of germinates and it's a hotbed for all of this stuff to take place. I remember I had a Muslim friend very close to me, let's call her Zainab. So I went to visit Zainab in her dorm room, which was very close to mine. And she knew I was coming, so she left the door unlocked. So I opened the door to go, I, we had to go through the living room in that suite to get to her room and we were gonna hang out in her room. And she had a female roommate, but she was not Muslim. And when I opened the door, I walked in on her female roommate, her non-Muslim roommate, uh, in bed with her girlfriend. They were lesbians. I didn't need to see that, but I did. Number four, drugs and alcohol. I remember smelling a specific disgusting smell one Friday night when we were walking past some dorm buildings on campus and it was me and a couple other Muslim girls and that smell was so gross that I said something like, oh, what is that disgusting smell? I didn't know what it was. And one of the girls told me, that's weed. You've never smelled weed before? That's marijuana. And I had never smelled that smell before. I didn't know what it was. I had never recognized the smell of weed or the stench of alcohol because those were things I had never been exposed to before then. But you smell these disgusting smells on campus pretty much every weekend because what people do when they party is they drink and they smoke. This is normal. This is something that becomes normalized and a lot of people get desensitized too. We don't want to get desensitized to these types of smells or these sights as Muslims. Number five, ikhtilat, gender mixing. There is a lot of gender mixing, inappropriate mixing between men and women on college campuses. And this is not only in class as part of like academic learning when you're sitting there in class with the professor, but also for social events hosted by the actual college, like Harvard University put on different socials and events and gatherings for students for whatever clubs and activities that you wanted to join. But also more depressingly, there were events hosted by the actual Muslim students in the Islamic society on campus, the MSA, right? And these events were very often mixed. There was ikhtilat like you wouldn't believe. Even though we were all Muslim and we knew that ikhtilat was not okay, this is not acceptable Islamically. Many events basically had men and women together, there were socials, there were dinners, and just things happened in this very casual way where Muslim brothers and sisters would kind of hang out together and chit chat. They would play, laugh or play games uh, and just flirt shamelessly right in the open, right in front of everyone. And I remember this was actually one of the most shocking and the most depressing aspects of social life for me at Harvard, was seeing Muslims behave in this way. I had never seen that before. I had grown up pretty sheltered in a practicing Muslim family with very strict parents. And this, seeing this kind of display from Muslims with their ikhtilat, it made me feel very alienated and it made me feel depressed, to be honest with you. I remember one night I was asked by one of the sisters in the MSA, hey, do you wanna go get ice cream? And I said, oh yeah, sure, that sounds fun. But then before I could, you know, be out the door with them, she also said, oh, also this brother's coming and that other brother's coming and then the other brother. And I remember just stopping in my tracks and just kind of making up an excuse like, oh, you know what? I just remembered I have to write this paper. I actually can't come after all. But I remember inside I was really sad because I wanted to go out, but I couldn't because I didn't want to engage in ikhtilat and that was just the norm. That was kind of how people hung out, men and women together, even Muslims. Number six, debt and riba. The college debt crisis is real and it affects not only us Muslims, it also affects non-Muslims. This is a national thing, it's a global thing. So, do you know how much a year at Harvard costs? Prices go up every single year, but for my senior year, which was over a decade ago, my senior year costs uh, $52,000. Just for one year, not four years, for one year. And that's a lot of money. <laughs> Luckily for me, my family was so poor and Harvard was so rich that it could afford to give me basically free grants to cover tuition and cover the cost. So Alhamdulillah, I ended up graduating debt free. But most people don't have this luxury. Most students graduate from college with crippling debt, with riba that multiplies day by day and it just keeps increasing and you sink into this hole of debt that you cannot get out of. Not only is riba haram and it brings about a war from Allah and his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, 
as we see in the ayah towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. But also, these ribawi loans wreak havoc on the physical health and the mental well-being of the person in debt. You basically leave college and you're told, okay, well, you signed this paper when you were 18 years old. Now you owe us money. And now you have to run and scramble and find a very high paying job, not necessarily a job that you would like or a job that you would choose for yourself voluntarily, but a job that can be pay you enough money for you to be able to pay back these loans that you have that are, in, you know, and you're racing against the clock because you're, you have riba. This is what riba means. So you just sink into this hole that gets deeper and deeper and deeper every day, as does your depression. If you're interested in this, I actually wrote uh, about a year ago, I wrote a long post on Facebook about this, and it's also on Muslim Skeptic on the website. And the title is Riba, Women, and the Western Educational System, if you're interested in reading more. Number seven, feminism. I also wrote a long 10-part article on this issue of femi feminism. So I'm not gonna go through all of this now, we don't have the time, but if you're so inclined, you can look it up on the Muslim Skeptic website and the article is called Confessions of an Ex-Feminist. And inshallah, you can read the fun details there. But the reality is I was exposed to feminist thinking and feminist ideas in college much more than anywhere else I went before that and after that. College was, again, this breeding ground for feminism and feminist uh, thinking and the feminist psyche. And it seeped into my own mind and it poisoned my thinking. It tainted the way I saw the world and I got that from college. I was a traditional, practicing young Muslim woman who wore hijab. I wore the abaya and I was practicing and doing my best in terms of ibadah, but I was still a feminist and I didn't realize it initially. And when I realized it, I just didn't care because when you're surrounded by that, you just go with the flow. You're not, you're not interested in sticking out and, you know, taking a grandstand. It's just, well, everybody kind of thinks like this. I guess I think like this too. I guess we're all feminists. That's fine. So this is all but inevitable at a liberal arts university. Number eight anti-marriage sentiment. Not everyone is the same, so I don't claim to speak for all women here, but I'll tell you about myself. I entered college as a freshman thinking I would do my four years of undergrad, then inshallah I would do my master's degree, then I would do my PhD in something, anything really. I didn't even know what, but I knew the roadmap, I knew the plan, and that plan did not include marriage. In fact, marriage was straight up antithetical to my roadmap because it would most likely derail all my plans, my professional and my academic plans for myself because marriage often also means kids and who has time for a husband and kids when I had a master's and a PhD to get to. There's a clear competition between the two paths. There is this tension between college and career on the one hand and then marriage and family on the other. And you, you'll notice that point number eight is also intertwined with point number seven, of course. Now, number nine, waste of time, youth, and beauty. I didn't know this at the time, but now with the advantage of time, life experience, maturity, I realized looking back that college takes the best years of a woman's life. Not a man's life, though, but the best years of a woman's life, her late teens and her early 20s. This is when a woman is at the peak of her youth, her beauty, her energy, her fertility, her attractiveness as a mate. Now, I'm not saying that all of those things disappear after college forever. They don't. But I am saying that this is the peak and it's reached between the ages of 18 to 22 years of age, which is the college years. Note the uncomfortable, awkward fact that this is true only for women and not for men. And we'll explain it more inshallah later. Number 10, delaying happiness. Again, I'll speak for myself here, even though this truth applies to the majority of women. Happiness does not lie in a fancy degree or a prestigious education from a fine American institution like Harvard University or this really amazing high-flying career. Happiness for women comes from love. Happiness for women comes from relationships. Women value relationships, uh, beautiful relationships that are nurturing and fulfilling from the love of a good man, the, uh, the husband who is caring and loving, a good protector, a good provider. He cares about us. He shows you know, his love in different ways. This is what we women love and this is what we crave. And we want a warm home. We want beautiful children. We want the warmth and the happiness and the closeness of a tight-knit family. This is what brings us happiness. But again, when it comes to college and spending your time and spending your energy devoted in that direction, you start delaying thoughts of family. You start delaying thoughts of marriage. So you deny yourself that joy. 
I know I did. I rejected my husband the first time he asked me to marry him because I was only 18. And again, I was a feminist and I thought, I don't need to get married now. I am way, way too young. This is not the time for a marriage. This is the time for me to go to college, further my career, establish myself and all of that stuff that we all hear every day. So I was operating under points number seven, number eight, number nine. I delayed my own happiness, chasing the perception of success that I had at the time, which is higher education and career advancement. But for what? Honestly, for what? Did I get a fancy job with my fancy degree? Did I make the big bucks as a doctor or a lawyer or a consultant at McKinsey so I can achieve financial independence and help my aging parents? Did my world-class education ensure me options in case my marriage goes south? Did my education expand my horizons? Did I gain wisdom and real superior intelligence at Harvard? Did the Harvard title bestow upon me anything more tangible than social prestige or bragging rights, which honestly interfere with humility anyway. They engender feelings of kib in many, many people. Did Harvard do anything for me except for that? And my honest answer is no, I don't think so. I sincerely believe that college did not expand my wisdom or my intelligence or my horizons. It's not obvious to me that had I taken a different route, I would be a much different person from who I am now or even who I was before. What some people try to tell me is that the only reason I'm able to homeschool my kids now is that I went to Harvard. That's not true. This is completely false. What I use now, what I rely on now to homeschool my children are things that I learned outside of college, namely my Islamic tarbiya, how my parents raised me, the values that they uh, brought me up with, the, the Quran that I memorized with my father all through my childhood, my teenage years, the traditional Islamic knowledge, the ilm, the basic furud ayn kind of knowledge that I got before I got uh, married and before I went to college, and then that I continued to learn slowly after from my father, from my husband, from various female teachers in the private sphere. This is what I use now to educate my children at home. I'm not relying on my college education because it didn't add to my dini knowledge. It didn't add to my ilm, which is that is what I'm using to teach my children at home. Now, if I had a daughter, I would not send her to college, Harvard or not. I would teach her the deen, her furud al make sure that she's healthy, that she's stable emotionally and psychologically, and I would impart to her traditional wisdom from the deen. I would make sure she was well prepared for marriage and for motherhood. I would invest in her marriage prep like most modern parents invest in their kids' college prep. I would be as diligent in vetting her marriage proposals the way most modern parents are diligent about their kids' college applications. Marriage and family are the things that will most likely bring her happiness, inshallah, and true fulfillment and long-term well-being. Now, some people ask, well, if you don't send your daughter to college, would you send your son? Isn't that hypocrisy if you don't do the same for both son and daughter? And my answer is no. There is a difference between men and women, and I'll give you two that are relevant to this specific scenario. The first difference between men and women is the difference in men's and women's roles in the family. Now, this is very basic. In Islam, we have gender roles. Men and women have very different but complementary roles that they fulfill in the family. Men are tasked with providing for their wives, their children, their families. This is a responsibility that men did not choose, but they are going to be answering to Allah for their actions and for how they performed in this sphere of financial provision before Allah. They have to work and make money and provide for their families whether they like it or not. Women, on the other hand, have no such financial obligations. We will not be answerable to Allah for how well we provided financially for our families. Men have that and we don't. So women don't have the same need to go to college because we don't have the same need to pursue a job and make that money to provide the way that men do. Number two, men's and women's different fertility windows. Now, men can have children at any age because their fertility window is huge. It is massive in comparison to women's. A woman's time to have children is quite limited. It is very finite and it runs out. And this is what we know colloquially as the biological clock, right? And a lot of women, you kind of hear jokingly talking about this outdated idea that your biological clock is ticking. 
but this is basic biology, unfortunately. Whether you like it or not, this is reality. And if you want to be delusional and think there's no difference between men and women, and men and women have different, they are different, but they have the same outcome, that is your choice. But the reality is different. You should base your assessments on facts and not feelings. But even in terms of feelings, we've already covered the reality that what brings women, most women, Real, true happiness is love and quality relationships, a good marriage, not a degree or a career. Now, aside from the happiness of the individual woman, because that's not what we base things on, right? We don't just, it's, this is not the end all be all of how we do things. It's just how will it make the individual woman feel and will it contribute to her happiness? That's good to consider. It's a consideration amongst many. But the other thing that we want to think about is the health and the overall well-being of the entire ummah as a collective. When women are encouraged and when they're pushed to pursue higher education and a career en masse, this changes the character of the Muslim ummah as a whole. There is a massive shift in priorities on a large scale societal level. And instead of serious, dedicated mothers who are devoted to raising a new generation of strong Muslims, we have atomized individual females who are looking out for themselves in terms of their own short-term security and seeking financial independence for themselves. What does this trend mean for the ummah, for the future of the ummah as a whole? Who will attend to the tasks that the women had attended to previously that have now been neglected? I've seen a lot of sisters online give various reasons for why they feel it's important for women to pursue higher education and career, but the common denominator is this for women to become financially independent so that they don't have to rely on a husband. So she doesn't have to be at her husband's mercy. So he, he doesn't get that kind of control over her because her husband is all but expected to cheat, be abusive, divorce, marry a second wife in secret, or die. It makes many modern women uncomfortable to feel so dependent on a husband, to feel so tied to him, so reliant on him providing for her. It makes many modern women feel uncomfortable to be vulnerable. Now, this is a word we're going to talk about a lot from here on out in this video, this idea of vulnerability. Let's explore this concept a little bit. So women, to erase this vulnerability, many modern women seek empowerment through education and career. But the reality is this. This points to a larger, much deeper, much more serious problem, which is an inability to have true tawakkul on Allah and trust in his plan. This system of men providing and women nurturing the family is created by Allah himself, the creator of both men and women. To cling to all these hypothetical bad scenarios and horror stories of women being left to fend for themselves or being at the mercy of a bad man is a betrayal of our own deep-seated insecurities and our own trust issues, including lack of trust in Allah and in his divine wisdom. Our mother Hajar radiallahu anha, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, she demonstrated the amazing tawakkul that women should have, that we should have as wives and as mothers. She demonstrated her trust in her husband and her ultimate trust in Allah and tawakkul on him completely. She's a role model for us. So we all know the story of when Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was commanded by Allah to take his wife Hajar and their infant baby Ismail السلام, and walk with them all the way to the barren desert that would later become Mecca. But in that moment was an absolute empty barren land. No food, no money, no people, nothing. And as he turned to walk away from Hajar, Hajar called after him, Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to do this? قال, نعم. He said yes. قالت, إذن لا يضيعنا. I love her response. I'm always amazed by her reply to her husband in that moment. She said, then in that case, he will not abandon us. Allah will not leave us. Think about that. I'm impressed by this woman's intelligence. By, I'm inspired by her total tawakkul on Allah. She didn't lose faith for a second, even though the situation looked very, very dire. But subhanAllah, this is the faith that we should aspire to, that we should try to have, inshallah. So part of the answer for us women lies in deepening our tawakkul on rely and reliance on Allah and to trust in his uh, system for us, both on the individual and on the collective levels. This means having discernment and taking the asbab, of course, in vetting and picking the right man to marry. But then it also means having trust in the husband. Now, some people try to make the argument that men and women are equal in Islam, so they should have equal access to education and empowerment. Now we're just getting sloppy. 
Men and women are equal before Allah in rewards for ibadah, for acts of worship. But men and women are not equal in roles, rights, or responsibilities. Again, revisit the idea of gender roles. We are not equal in everything. There's a clear hierarchy of the genders on the levels of family, community, and the ummah at large. This is where the ayah comes in. This ayah directly states a hierarchy and thus a vulnerability for women. So this is the second piece of the answer, and it lies in accepting the reality of our inherent vulnerability as women. Women are vulnerable by design. Allah created us in a certain way, and he uh, calibrated a system, he created a system for us, for the family and society, community, and then the ummah at large, that involves certain levels of vulnerability. Women are vulnerable to men. Hawa, uh, salam, was created from the rib of her husband, Adam salam. We wives are tied to our husbands. We're dependent on them. We are reliant on them for many things. This is true whether we like it or not. Our feminine vulnerability, however, is not a weakness. It's not a bad thing. It's not a shameful sin or like a secret that we have to be embarrassed about. Feminine vulnerability brings out a corresponding masculine responsibility. Feminine dependence brings out a corresponding masculine dependability. It's how Allah has created us human beings. So let me give you an analogy. What if someone came to you and said, you know, child abuse is a really big problem. And since children are so vulnerable because they're so dependent on parents, you know what we should do? As soon as any child is born, as soon as the baby, you know, is brought into this world, we should take that baby immediately and put that baby in state care. We should put that baby in an institution so that we can prevent any and all possibilities of abuse from these potentially abusive parents. That way, this is a, this is the safest route. This is kind of a preemptive strike against even the potential, the chance that the parents may abuse the baby. We don't want any misuse of power. So if you were to reply to that and say, no, that will destroy the family and it's not even necessary because while parental abuse does sometimes happen, it's not so common that it calls for such drastic and just destructive measures. The family is going to be wiped out. The response will be, do you want kids to be beaten, abused? What about unfit parents? What about child neglect? What if the parent dies? What about incest? Do you just hate children? And we would say correctly that this is just fear mongering. This is an attempt to exploit people's fear of their vulnerabilities being exploited. And this is an attempt to paint all parents as inherently untrustworthy and potential abusers, right? This is what the liberal state does. This, for example, is what the liberal state in Sweden is currently doing anyway, taking children away from their Muslim parents under these little silly excuses and these pretexts. Oh, these parents are unfit. These parents have a potential for abuse. Let's take their kids away. Another example of this systematic liberal fear-mongering technique is the imam at the masjid. The liberal secular state wants to paint all imams as inherently untrustworthy and potential abusers of the jama'ah, the congregation. So we hear things like, oh, this sheikh might be a spiritual predator. This might turn out to be spiritual abuse. What if this imam misuses his power in the community? Let's install our own people like social workers and government and state trained imams to guide you and teach you your deen instead of this traditional alim here who may or may not be abusive. We don't want any instance of abuse. We're not gonna give abuse a chance. This is how liberal states take over by pushing individualism and cutting healthy ties and healthy dependence between people. They do this by pointing to vulnerability. The vulnerability of children, the vulnerability of women, the vulnerability of the community to someone like a leader or an imam who's supposed to guide them. These are all vulnerabilities. And vulnerability comes from a power differential, right? It comes from hierarchy, but it has a very important function. It serves to make bonds stronger and more loving. Because, for example, my child is 100% dependent on me. I am 100% devoted to him. I am dedicated to his protection, his provision, to looking out for him and attending to his every need. And they call this the attachment system. And there's nothing more beautiful, even when you look at psychological studies, for example, that look at the mother and the infant mother bond, there's nothing more beautiful than the attachment system between mother and infant or father and infant. So the attachment is incredibly high between parent and child. 
And similarly, the attachment between husband and wife is incredibly high due to the power differential between husband and wife and the gender roles that Allah has given us and the vulnerability of the wife. Trying to erase this vulnerability or just do away with it through education, career, choices, options, this only leads to a weakened, more unstable attachment and a less sturdy bond between husband and wife. Vulnerability is not a bad thing. It has a beautiful, natural function in deepening bonds between people and forging strong, stable relationships. But the liberal state exploits the natural fear that, you know, many of us have of our vulnerability being used against us in order for the state to destroy these organic human relationships and just crank out more consumers, more atomized individuals who will do the bidding of the state because they rely on the state more instead of relying on one another. On the, this happens on the levels of marriage, parenthood and family and the community. So for us women, this concept of vulnerability means that we are happiest and most comfortable at home, nestled within the loving atmosphere of our family and our loved ones, dealing primarily with our friends and our family instead of most of the time strangers, raising our own cute babies instead of doing work for other people and helping our own husbands at home instead of answering to some uncaring boss at work who couldn't care less what happens to us. Shielded, protected, cherished, and yes, vulnerable and dependent, and that's okay. But when we decide that we want to seek independence in order to eliminate this vulnerability, that we want to take the matter of provision into our own hands because men cannot be trusted to provide for us, that also means that the important work that we had been doing before now is now left undone. The post that we had been holding is now abandoned. We've left our original purpose and taken up a new one we've chosen for ourselves based on fear and on mistrust. The reality is there is risk in anything anybody does, right? What if I step outside my house and I get hit by a bus? What if I move to Florida and I get attacked by an alligator? What if I move to California and get killed in an earthquake? No place is 100% safe. No place is danger free. Nothing in this dunya is risk free because this is the nature of the dunya. We don't live in Jannah, we live in the dunya and there are risks associated with everything. And we live with a certain amount of risk in pretty much everything we do. But this is the key. We have collectively become biased in what kinds of risks we focus on and what kinds of risks we just accept as no big deal. So to bring it to this issue of women's college education and career, what if this was the response, right? What if this is collectively what we have gotten used to? What if I go to work and get sexually harassed? Or what if I go to college and get raped on campus? What if I lose my Iman and lose my Deen? Is this the dominant cultural narrative though? No. We can bring up the risk of any action in life. Today, most people have become familiar with the risks of not pursuing the path of education and career than the risks of that path. We've just developed this blind spot such that if anyone dares to bring up the dangers and the risks of what we've come to accept, which is education and careers for women, we immediately regurgitate the well-rehearsed list of risks that we've collectively gotten used to hearing and saying. We've become biased towards certain things, the education of women, going to college, having a career, and reflexively defend these things even despite their many risks and their many proven dangers. And we've learned to have a knee-jerk reaction against any other path whose risks we've become fixated on and just obsessed with. And it's important for us to be honest with ourselves and to recognize this. But there's another level to this discussion of risk, which is aside from the individual risk assessment that each person will do in his or her own life, the risks of not going to college or working outside the home are possibilities. Nobody's denying that. These things are possibilities that sometimes do happen while Note this big difference. While the risks of pursuing college and career at the expense of marriage and family, they're not mere hypothetical realities. But there's another level to this discussion. Aside from the individual risk assessment that each person will do in her life or his life, which is this. The risks of not going to college and working outside the home are possibilities. Nobody's negating that. Nobody's denying that. These are possibilities that sometimes do happen. 
while, note the difference now, while the risks of pursuing college and career at the expense of marriage and family are not mere hypothetical possibilities. They are actual realities on the ground staring us in the face. These aren't things that may or may not happen, like my husband might turn out to be abusive or lazy or die before I do. These are things that have already happened. The breakdown of family, the dwindling rates of marriage, the increase in divorce, the atomization of people in society, the abandonment of children, the utter lack of tarbiya, and the raising of children on smartphones, the internet, social media, increased crime in society, increased school shootings and shootings in general, etc., etc., etc. None of this is hypothetical. This is our current reality. Trying to run away from the potential risks of a potentially abusive marriage by pursuing higher education and career is like running away from a spider that may or may not bite you by jumping into a fire that will definitely kill you. So this path is not one that we should be reflexively, blindly pushing our Muslim daughters into out of fear. We as an ummah need to rethink our priorities and shift our attitudes. We need to think more critically about our relative valuation of career and education versus marriage and family, especially for women. In some countries, Muslim women don't get good marriage proposals if the women don't have good degrees in secular education. This is crazy. This is what we as a Muslim ummah collectively need to get away from. This is what we need to fix. We may not be able to solve the problem completely in today's non-ideal world in terms of secularized, modernized realities that we're living in, but we can at least have an intelligent conversation about it. And we can start by admitting that there are massive problems inherent to pushing women en masse to go to college and pursue careers, and by acknowledging that the collective and individual losses we incur in taking this path of women's empowerment through education and career are much, much worse than the perceived risks of taking the path of embracing women's vulnerability and working with that within the holistic, comprehensive Islamic family model. The default direction for Muslim women should not be reflexively just pursuing career, pursuing college, higher education. The default direction should be pursuing marriage and family. The other path that we are being pushed into by the liberal secular order leads to dystopia. May Allah save us.